for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! In the, country. the next major war for the United States is with ISIS. But what media and politicians are not telling you the truth about, where ISIS came from, who created them, and why before one more dollar is spent, one more American life lost, you need to know the truth. The first step toward truth is to be informed. The name ISIS is one that every American knows by now. The biggest threat to our national security since Al-Qaeda, right? They are a brutal, savage group known for public beheadings and mass executions. They are the face of the new war on terror. Right now, the U.S. military is conducting airstrikes in Syria in a supposed attempt to take out ISIS targets. Meanwhile, the White House and military leaders are talking about possible boots on the ground in Iraq again only three years after the war in Iraq was declared over. In fact, this war, according to former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, could last for decades. I think we're looking at uh, kind of a 30-year war uh, kind of uh, history here. So who exactly is ISIS? And where did they come from? It's entirely a creation of the United States' behavior in Iraq. That's how we got to where we are because of war, because of occupation, because of torture. For answers, we travel to Los Angeles to meet with Angela Keaton, the founder of antiwar.com. We destabilized and wrecked Iraq. I mean, it, it caused it to, to fail miserably, and that's entirely the responsibility of the United States government. There's no one else at fault there. I mean, as horrible as Saddam Hussein was, there was, you know, Iraq was not unstable. It was a functioning country as much as those sorts of things go and it was not a particularly horrible hellhole if you were a religious minority. To understand where ISIS comes from, you have to understand two storylines. The first is what Keaton just said. When the U.S. first went into Iraq, we blew the country apart. We destroyed the government, toppled Saddam Hussein, destroyed infrastructure, and most importantly, left behind a power vacuum. One that would have never have existed had Hussein not been overthrown by the U.S. government. Daniel McAdams with the Ron Paul Institute says this is an historical fact that media just won't discuss. All of this has to do with U.S. action in the region, which destroyed the infrastructure, which destroyed Iraqi society, which destroyed the government. Uh, you had a lot of people who lived under Saddam Hussein, uh, who may not have been as, as happy as Lark's, Nevertheless, they were living somewhat normal lives. The U.S. put a government in power in Baghdad uh, that all of a sudden was, was their enemies, that treated them very, very badly. Now that is the easy part of the story. The U.S. created conditions in Iraq where ISIS could get its start. But here's the other storyline that you have to understand, that even with Saddam gone, ISIS still couldn't have risen to power had it not been for what happened next. ISIS actually began as a small insurgent group in Iraq in 2006. They had no money, no real ability to recruit, but they did work to create very limited problems for the U.S. military. It wasn't until 2009 that ISIS shifted its focus from Iraq, where it was largely unsuccessful in developing a foothold, and focused on the civil war in Syria. Even there, ISIS struggled to gain any foothold because the two largest groups fighting against President Bashar al-Assad were al-Nusra Front, or al-Qaeda, and the Free Syrian Army. Then came a pivotal moment that most Americans aren't even aware of. In June of 2013, a northern general for the Free Syrian Army spoke out on Al Jazeera Qatar and stated that if international forces did not send weapons the rebels attempting to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad would lose their war in just one month. Well, only months before, I had personally confronted President Obama about why the U.S. was covertly funding those Syrian rebels. And yet there's some concern about the U.S. funding uh, the Syrian opposition when yeah. there are a lot of reports that al-Qaeda is yeah. kind of heading up that opposition. Yeah. How do you justify the two? Well, I, uh, I share that concern. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is to say, we will provide non-lethal assistance to Syrian opposition leadership that are committed to a political transition, committed to 
uh, a, uh, an observance of human rights. We're not going to just dive in and get involved with a civil war that in fact uh, involves some elements of people who are genuinely trying to get a better life, but also involve uh, some folks who would over the long term do uh, the United States harm. So even as the president acted as if he was being careful, politicians like Senator John McCain demanded action. So it's a totally unfair and unbalanced fight. And now the rebels are the freedom fighters. The, uh, the Syrian National Army are, uh, are being beaten every place around Syria because of the overwhelming firepower and air power is really the deciding factor. So you've got to take their air power, power out of it. You've got to have a safe zone where they can operate, train and equip. And uh, we've got to turn this thing around. So what happened? Well, within just a matter of weeks of that Syrian general making his plea for international help, the U.S., the Saudis, Jordan, Qatar, Turkey, and Israel began providing weapons and training and money to the so-called rebel Free Syrian Army. By September of 2013, American media outlets, including CNN and the Washington Post, were reporting that CIA-funded weapons had begun flowing to Syrian rebels. The weapons were not American-made, but funded and organized by the CIA. The artillery was described as light weapons, some anti-tank weapons and ammunition. But where it all fell apart, weapons that the U.S. insisted would be used by freedom fighters would be in less than one year in the hands of ISIS fighters. So where were these fighters coming from? Actually, from the Free Syrian Army, the group that John McCain insisted would help the U.S. to overthrow Assad. That same group actually giving weapons, selling weapons, and sending fighters to join with this new group called the Islamic State. It was in June of 2014 when suddenly, after being a no-name group in Syria, that ISIS emerged, heavily armed and trained by U.S. and coalition special forces, making a dramatic entrance by crossing back over the Syrian border into Iraq capturing Mosul and much of the northern part of the country. One of the most important facts that mainstream media ignores time and time again is that ISIS was able to grow so fast because of all the U.S. military equipment they were able to seize, equipment that our military left in Iraq, truckloads of Humvees, tanks, and weaponry that instead of taking or destroying, the U.S. government simply decided to leave behind. Even when the U.S. government knew that ISIS fighters were capturing that equipment, for crying out loud, these guys were posting pictures of themselves driving and standing on U.S. military equipment, making video of themselves with it. We did nothing. Why? How is it the U.S. had no idea that this threat was coming? Uh, how many billions did we spend? Maybe a hundred billion on the on the total intelligence community budget over over the year. How is it that they had no idea? How is it that if this was such a threat? as, uh, as um, John McCain and Lindsey Graham are fond of reminding us, how is it that it was missed so unbelievably, so egregiously? Over the past few months, the U.S. government, who acted like they had never even heard of ISIS, suddenly, with the help of media, has turned the Islamic State into the new focus of the war on terror. Now, as ISIS has continued its rise, recruitment is exploding, and the group is becoming stunningly wealthy. ISIS is the, is the best funded terrorist group in the world. They make some, I think it's $2 million a day selling oil, much of it to Turkey, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, and if you look at the U.S. response to this, uh, the U.S. response to ISIS becoming extremely rich by selling oil and undercutting the competition is to blow up the oil fields, which to me makes no sense. You're blowing up the infrastructure. It happens to be in Syria, so you might think that there is a, a, another motive there. But well, why wouldn't you, the U.S. sanctions anything that moves when it's angry. Why can't you sanction the banks that are helping finance these deals? Why can't you sanction the oil companies that are participating in this? Why do you blow up the oil fields? It's a great question. And here are some other questions that defy logic when you start looking for answers. Why is the U.S. sending $500 million to the Free Syrian Army to fight ISIS when the FSA is one of the biggest suppliers of fighters and weapons to ISIS? Why are we sending new and more powerful weapons to the FSA like anti-aircraft missiles, weapons that we know will end up in the hands of ISIS? ISIS, of course, is going to now have anti-aircraft missiles provided by the U.S. and the Saudis. 
The Saudis in got, are getting them from the Chinese, though, now, so there can be plausible deniability because inevitably these sweethearts in the sweetheart rebel groups in Syria are going to start shooting down, if they have the ability, passenger, passenger jets. And then we're going to want the plausible deniability and say, no, 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 it's the Chinese weaponry, as if it's going to make any difference. Well, there are so many questions that we could ask, but let's just cut to the chase here, because what you need to know about this is that ISIS is not the creation of American inaction, which is what the media is going to tell you. No, they are the product of direct action. First, the action of creating a power vacuum in Iraq, and secondly, arming violent jihadists, hoping they would overthrow a leader in a neighboring Middle Eastern country. McAdams says the U.S. government is a victim of its own insane policies. Well, I think the U.S. is really a hostage to its own regime change philosophy. Uh, you know, the U.S. is very good at blowing things up and destroying societies, but it is very, very bad at putting them back together. Is that true? Well, you decide. Fact. Our government armed Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and created al-Qaeda. Fact. Our government we helped supply Saddam Hussein we chemical weapons for him to use against Iran in 1980 and then overthrew him in 2003. Fact. Our government trained rebel fighters in Syria who have become the group today known as ISIS or the Islamic State. We have watched them commit every violent atrocity that you can imagine to people living in Iraq and Syria. And now we want American taxpayers to fund a 30-year war against them. No, it's not the U.S. government being held hostage by these crazy policies. It's the American people. And it's time that we reject the destruction of people groups around the world for the sake of foreign policy that makes so-called defense contractors rich and perpetuates violence, death, and destruction of entire people groups. Because humanity is greater than politics. Step up to the plate. All right, so why well, we don't know the big headliner is it come like the the, the politics war start now. Yes, the, the politics war, the killing for red or orange. Oh, sorry, orange or, or green. Look like it start now. People start dead because of colors. Well, I mean, I tell you. And then now we see a big thing going on in America today. Them, uh, about them say, well, them don't sure yet, but them say between one and three men going a building and a 14 people them kill, shut up the place, and about 17 injured them say more good are dead. Out of that 17, they were injured. Terrible thing. Them don't know as well. Them don't know if he's militias or them don't know if he's terrorists. You know, the militia, them, what them call militias is people who have a gross, is internal groups who have a gross against the government or against a certain group. You know, for instance, like the Ku Klux Klan. Them, them, them call them, them, when them come together and call them, say, them, them, the people them call them militia. Where them have guns and all that other thing and them protest physically and violently against the system. Or it could be, well, I don't, I don't think it's no, no ISIS people them because, you know, ISIS people them now run. <laughs> them now run. I date them I work with, them now run, and you know, see no, no, no bomb inside it, so where you can't say somebody tie and bomb on themselves. They, apparently, the three man them run, but I, I, I hear you so say them, they, they, them, they pan them tail, pee pee, clack, clack, so. But, you know, I really want to bring the attention to then and now. And when I say then and now, we are talking about then, we are talking about like maybe, 1500 years ago and even earlier than that into the like the 14th 15th century you know um and oh 
the media, the American media manipulate the minds of the people. Hey, you frighten me, you know. <laughs> Keshiva, you frighten me, you know what I'm saying? You don't know, talk something serious and you come up here with your mouth. <laughs> no, Keshiva, fright, hey, you frighten me, you know, Keshiva. <laughs> Good night, my Keshiva. Yes. <laughs> Happy birthday to Tony. Tony is 25 today. You think me now call you, you think you now call 25. Tony is 25. Hey man, them out there, don't make Tony tell you no lie. She's 25 year old today. Okay. Who are you up, Neil? Who are left you right now? Happy redance. You think I care? I don't care if you left you know. Tomorrow, boss. Boss. You better go to a reference for your PA, you talk about bars. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to the story. The, the war where America said them a fight against terrorism. Remember Bush proclaimed a crusade, you know, as a Christian. He proclaimed a crusade, so he got into one of the most ancient countries. If you notice, I hope people don't realize it, but most of the things that were happened in the early part of the Bible, before Abraham, up to Abraham, because we must understand, say, if you follow the, the story of the Bible, Abraham was an Iraqi, a Iraq, Abraham come from, you know? Yeah, Iraq him come from, according to it go. He was coming up from the Orab, the Chaldees. Ancient country, Mesopotamia. Them used to call it Mesopotamia. And Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, which was the hanging gardens of Babylon, which is proclaimed one of the seven wonders of the world, was in Iraq. Now, a crusade, which is that them call it, a crusade against those people over there, what them call Muslims. Them don't want to say Muslim, them are fighting against, but it's Muslims because years before that, them did lead a crusade into Jerusalem to get out the Muslim them. Them call them the Knights Templar. For those of you who want to go back in our history, the Knights Templar, we're going to make the connection soon. Just bear with me. Because you might have wondered why we are talking about the killing we are going to today and that. But we're going to make the connection. The Knights Templar went into the so-called Middle East and devastated it. And a crusade against the Muslims. And we must remember that most of North Africa, like what we call the Moors, the Moors were Muslims because the Arab them infiltrate North Africa and spread them religion in North Africa mostly. And then these Muslims find themselves in a Spain, Italy, and all those places to the point where them did have to start an inquisition in a Spain for drive out the Muslims and the Jews. You had to convert to Roman Catholicism or you would be burnt or beheaded. Burnt or beheaded. In France, them used to have a thing named the guillotine. For those of you who don't know what guillotine is, can I explain that to you now? It's a, it's a thing where I don't even know if to describe it, but it's a, it's a sharp metal where them draw up with a rope and them make a little thing for put your, just make your head, make your neck hole in that thing and it and just let go there. It's like a, it's like an axe. It's like an axe without the, the, the stick. The, 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 
I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> Believe you me, I don't know how to describe it. Go for it and it and see. But anyway, them used to be head of all the people who them find say wasn't in line with Rome, the Pope. And when the guy when he Constantinople, Constantine, Emperor Constantine decide that him going to make Christianity be the national religion of Rome. Because he realized eh, Christianity was so influential in a Rome. But yet still them did have them own kind of religious practices. So in order to appease everybody, what them do was to fuse the Roman traditional religious practices with Christianity. That is why you have so much religious practices that is intertwined in Christianity. Well, Abraham supposed to be the father of the, the three major Western religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All of them trace back them origin in this one man named Abraham. Out of Abraham came Israel and came Ishmael and then evolved into Christianity. And what happened is that the Christians take all of the West. Because of the influence of the Pope. And what them call Christendom. The Pope was the, the one who, if you don't fall in line with the Catholic Church, you would be burnt for witchcraft. Or you would be beheaded, depending on where you is. In France, you would be placed under the guillotine. If you was in other parts of Europe, you would be burnt in the center of the square, tie up on a stake, and everybody stand up there and cheer, 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 and watch your flesh disintegrate. This was, this, this was what you call Christian people doing these things. And in the earlier, in, in, in coming up in this time, now we say, America, under a Christian prime president, invaded a country that was much, much older and more ancient than any America. And dropped bombs and killed the people, them, and create a fuck at the country that there is no country anymore. The country is now overrun by what them now call terrorists. But guess what now? The terrorists them claim so them is Muslims, Islams. So here we are confronted again with the same old story. Christianity and Islam. What we see taking place now amongst this extremist group called themselves ISIL is that they are doing what the Christians used to do in Europe to people who them claim say is not a freedom elk. Where them say if you don't in line with them farm of Islam, them going to be edio or do any other thing, evil thing. Cause evil thing, evil thing that them want to do. So what we see is that Christianity and Islam, the two major religions them right now in the West here, has been going on so for centuries, killing each other, murdering each other in the name of the Lord. Terrible thing. Terrible thing. Now we see some guys come chop up people. Today we see a guy without any mask on him head. 
You know them to them kill jihad, Joe, John, or whatsoever I'm name now, where them, them show a guy to their bed, a, a, a Russian. Him no have on a mask. And him attack in a Russian and I tell them, say, watch out now, you see you no Russian? We all kill everyone on the sun and everybody who them only, only killing and bombing them and are defend Assad. These are people who is doing these things according to them in the name of God. What me say? They might do these things in the name of God. More people dead in wars in the Western world here. In the name of God than in any other name on earth. Wars have been fought in the name of God. So-called creator of heaven and earth and any other dispute. Whether it is Christians or it is Islam. They are contending for world supremacy. We're going to come forward. Yeah, so we're going to talk about Christianity and Islam and how oh, Christianity and Islam devastate the whole place with them war and to say who oh, going to rule the world in the name of them God. One say Allah. One say God. And then you have the next one we say Yahweh. Which is the, the, the Jew them that. But when you look on Oh, the, uh, the evolution of this chop off head and burn at the stake thing. There's a man named James. It was James the Six. We are told that it was James the Six of Scotland and become King James the First of England. James was a very, what we call, Paranoid man, according to history, he was very against what them call now the devil, witchcraft. So he write a book named Demonology. <laughs> yes, the same King James where you say them say the version of the Bible where everybody hold dear to. He write a book named Demonology, and in the Demonology. Him show you the power of the devil manifesting itself in a witches. Because you know, it's mostly women them used to burn at the stake. There is mostly women. If you look at all them witch movie and see them lot and this and that, and most of women them them grab and burn at the stake. Well, this guy, King James, was terrible against. Then against these people, I'm very superstitious. I'm superstitious to the point where he put a whole heap of people to the stake, burn them to the stake because of his superstition. Very terrible against 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 it. And where we say up now is that King James Shakespeare. As a matter of fact, Shakespeare make King James which thing get popular to <laughs> Shakespeare. But I remember I go watch a play down a war theater one time named Macbeth. Them used to want to teach it in a school, but I couldn't really work with the, the, the Macbeth teaching at all. Anyway, Macbeth is one of them stories where I light witchcraft and all them things they light and it it, 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 it make King James, it give King James authority because it helps highlight the paranoia and the superstitious nature of King James. And when King James get all of the guys, them, including Shakespeare, to make a translation of the Bible, a woolly part witchcraft and things was put to rest because them create a thing named Satan. Satan is a, is a, is a new construct in the whole scheme of wrong and right. You know, so if everything, if everything is good, 
therefore nothing is good. I mean, I said that everything is good, there's nothing is good because if everything is good, you can't say it's good because you don't have nothing to associate it to find out if it's good. You have to have the opposite of good to find out if it's good. So if everything is good, nothing is good really. Likewise, if everything is bad, nothing is bad. Because you have to find the opposite of bad to say something bad. So, what Christianity do is find something that is opposite to God. You have people who have them thinking already about wickedness and cruel and evilness, you know, like long time, long before Christianity, long before you didn't have, you know, in the same place what we call Iran, Iraq, them places they create opposites. But the the rational about Satan, even when you reach Job and them mention Satan, because in a Job for this is Satan, the word come up. Satan play a great part in a for sure how strong Job was. And that story now symbolize a certain Faith in God that even though this man go through all the certain things, it symbolizes how him faith stronger than the desires of the world. And they have an story with the man named Jesus to when him go up to the mountain after 40 years, him in the wilderness. And them say, Satan come to him, the devil come to him and tempt him. And him overcome that. But man construct Satan. Like say Satan is something other than himself. We are telling you say Satan, the idea of the devil is a human construct. It have nothing to do with nothing outside a human being because it's only human being of that thinking there. No other creature upon earth think about devil. Likewise, God. So what we have now is that man have a fight in himself. There's a fight, a struggle. We will call between good and evil. And the good and evil is man represent that. There's no good and evil outside a man. All concepts of good and evil come from man action and reaction to either himself or to things or people, place and things that surround him in our environment. So King James was one of the, the chief superstitious person when it come on to killing people because them don't fall in line with the ideas and concepts of Christianity. And we see that now with the Muslim, the Islam, the, the, the people that will call themselves ISIL, that they are so fundamental, it's extreme. They are so extreme. Just like the Christians of old. Because all we hear them talk about the extreme. And we see the extremity, you know. We see the, we see the vicious and the cruelty, you know. But them, them now do nothing different from what the Christians them used to do. These people, because we are living at this time, and know why it looks so. When we see that on TV, and we can we, we can see it on TV as it happen because the man has shoot exactly where my do on the TV with the knife in him hand, and the man um, hold the knife over the man and start. I mean, right? Because everybody talk about it because it's so vicious. I know nothing different from a Christian do. And even in our times, when them look at our four parents. In the name of Jesus and throw it overboard. In the name of Jesus, them tie up our ancestors between two hours and beat 
the at the ass till before parents the and them just pop out one and gone is all one and gone is all the lynching what them do in the name of Jesus slavery done in the name of Jesus and you still have black people who will die in the name of Jesus because they want to be watched with the blood of the lamb in the name of Jesus and you can't tell them nothing no matter listen to me as I know and I vex and I puff up because them can't say that these thinking have nothing to do because them can't say that these thinking have nothing to do with an external force that is deciding that if you do this, you're going to burn. And if you do this, you're going to get a gold shoes. If you do this, you're going, your head going to get cut off. Or if you do this, you're going to get 72 virgin in a heaven. It has nothing to do with nothing outside of human being. It's human being that is deciding these things for other human beings. And if you don't fall in line, then blow up themselves and blow up 100 people. Then put bomb in a plane and bring down plane. Then take armies and go into other people's country and kill people in the name of Allah, in the name of Jesus. So you saw it go now. That these people is them create the politics, you know. It's them create politics. That's why I get scared when me hear the Prime Minister say she'll wait upon the mass of the her. Because me I get scared now. Me I get scared when me hear the Prime Minister say she'll wait upon the master and for touch her. Because what else with the master do that will inspire her or influence her to do? Because I have seen, and history can bear me out, that whenever people wait on the master to decide, to make, to decide, make, make them have a decision. We see what go on in a, in a, in a, in a, a Syria now. We see where the American, them go in a Iraq go do, in a the name of God. We see where the, 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 the crusade do. And it go on and on and on and on and on because the master touch them. Mama P, you have me scared, Rasta. You have me scared when me hear Prime Minister say them are wait for the hand of God. The master. Can me understand what that do in our history? We have to, we have to learn from history. You know? If we don't learn from history, we're going to repeat it. We have to learn from it. That's why the Jew them say, watch and never again. And up to this day, them are hunt down all of the Nazis, them, whether you are 190 or the old, them go hunt you down and find you and carry you to the court in a year and charge you for crimes against humanity. And what we see as all right now, it's not far from the door, you know. Kaka, I can't just decide where I right now. Right now, Jamaica, Jamaica, most of the people them are Christian. We don't like Christian, you know, because you know how much Christian them kill in a, in a Nigeria there. You know how much Christian the guys them slaughter 200 children. May I watch it, you know, may I watch it. Them line up 200 of them and just shoot all of them like them head. In the name of Allah. Allah Akbar, them like boom, 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 200 man dead. Because them say them are Christian. Them go bomb up a place in a in a Beirut and say them a Shiite. Them even though them a same Arab, them a say what you know. It's not the same Arab, you know. You must be the same religion, and not only the same religion, you know. As so extremist them is, you know. You must not only be the same religion, but you must practice religion like how we practice it. And that did not go on in a Europe, you know. You can't just be a Christian in a Europe, you know. You must be a Roman Catholic. And if you're not a, if you're a Christian, that's why them break away, you know. That's why you have Anglican Church in England 
and you have Roman Catholic Church. The Anglican Church is a breakaway by Henry VIII. We keep repeating the same thing. We then break away Henry VIII, break away and farm your own thing. Anglican Church. Because I realized why I didn't want to marry to him, can't keep buying, and I couldn't get married to her because the Pope had said, no, no, no. And he say, hey, well, me want to marry to her, you know, so you want to know. I don't know more Roman Catholic, you know. We just go farm my Anglican. So the Anglican Church become the Church of England. And where them say, the royal house must not marry to a Roman Catholic. A Christian, they might do this thing, you know. If you is a Christian, it's all right. But you are now. You have to practice the same kind of Christianity when you practice. Then that's where them do the little data. The little data down at the school. She don't send me, you know. I mean, she don't Jehovah Witness, you know. But them put, say, Jehovah Witness because them pass through Jehovah Witness. The church, the, the school said, look here, you can't, you can't hold a big position on your you know. You have to, even though Jehovah Witness are Christian, but you have to be the same kind of Christian like we. And that's right there, you know. You have to be the same kind of Christian like we. It no matter, you could have worship God and have prayed to God a little more. And that is Jesus Christ you are dealing If you don't talk about Jesus Christ like how we talk about Jesus Christ, we know not nothing with you. And at that, the Muslim, them are saying, the Islamic people, them are saying, the ISIL people, them are saying, watch out. Me, I worship a certain, certain way. You see, if you not do that way there, you could have ball out a lot, ball out, and kill you the same way. It's not a new phenomenon going on, you know. It's just that now, now the Christian them now do it. That you can't see it. But them are do it still. Them are do it still. The way the Ku Klux Klan is. The Ku Klux Klan is that set a man who feels them a Christian, you know. We say, them don't like homosexuals, them don't like blacks, and them don't like Jews. And what happened? Them pray every day. Them pray every day. Them is Christian. And they will kill you. Them don't like black people. Them feel that black people are not human being. It's like Hitler. Hitler never come with no religion. But Hitler decides to watch her. You see me you now? Me now make them people they call themselves Jews. Who is not even real pure white people. Come take over the economy of my country. No. And you know what it's what? Hitler was elected democratically, you know. Hitler never rise to war, to war, he never rise to power, to war, you know, it's true. A process. When me hear Bunting say, he may wait for a divine intervention to stop the crime rate in Jamaica. Me get scared. Me get scared. Me don't know about an next person, you know, but me, because me don't like the idea of a group of people coming together and tell me, say, when them do something, it's God make them do it. Because then, know when them do something bad, they're going to say, you know, say the devil terrible. Look what the devil make me do, do. And then them I do it. So they might absolve themselves from human actions, human thinking, and human perception. Them don't want to take responsibility for them action. A man go out there and them say, boy, the devil is strong, you know. You know, so me never want to box her down. I am woman, I'm a talk about, you know. Me never want to box her, you know. And him start to ball in front of him. I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, you know. And she say, all right, I'm sorry. And then the next week, I'm coming back to her again. But him not take responsibility for it. And the devil make him do it. And in the name of God, me go chop off your head. You can't tell him the same wrong. Because him have a feeling say God love him when him do that. When him tie on a bump on himself and blow up a hundred people in a market. He may go get 72 virgin when him go up there. What the hell am I going to do with 72 version up there? Who him no go up there go get 72 version and come back and tell him, say, boy, you want to get 72 version and I'm going to tell him I could have worked with you, know? 
Because by that time, it really want Viagra, and them never tell you to and bomb, you go get 72 virgin plus Viagra. So you have to go start figure out now, okay? Maybe I should not ask them if Viagra is not even. Because 72 virgin up there, and me can't manage 72. If they put that Viagra up there, we could have managed them. Them skip out something. Them should have tell you that 72 virgin plus couple pack of Viagra. But where we have now, everybody's scared. Everybody's scared. Everybody's scared. This is some Trinidadian from the television. I tell you, say, boy, right now, them come down there for come fight for ISIL. Some Trini a fight for ISIL in, a, in a Syria. A long time, we tell them, say, ISIL infiltrate Trinidadian. You know, but I never want to listen to you enough. And last year, we tell them, say, I want to leave ISIL down there. Then if ISIL down why you think, say, Jamaica? Jamaica, who always a follow everything and who always a create a, a, everything. Why you think, say, it's here, you know? Why you think, say, I still want to reach a Jamaica? Why you think, say, that not possible? You think, say, we're in a cocoon where we're in, we're not, we're not vulnerable to certain things. And she be catch with the other day. And we still don't know who bring it on here. Jamaican people. You say the religion. The religion is the worst thing that is happening right now to black people. The religion that we come on here, so come imitate. The religion will come on here, so come put in our thinking, our consciousness, and feel it about help you and save way. And a years now it there and it not do nothing for it. It not do nothing for it. Now we see politics. Now we see guys now. Where we did hope say never did go happen. We see it start up now. Where casualties is now there. We are green, orange. Man are dead, young up at colors now. Again. We think we did part that, you know. But you see the people, them, the people, them, in a such ignorance, you know. That meanwhile, them guide up, that said, no, we don't really want no violence and things. Uh, even though they must say that, they must set things out of their mouth for instigate violence. When you listen to these politicians, it's instigate them and instigate violence. And if I did up on the radio and say certain things, them would have want to take me off of the radio and sue radio station and this and lock down radio station and that. Every time one of them politicians you open their mouth, they might instigate violence against the next person. Against the next against the next party. Every time. If you if you listen to all of them meeting, they might the people them, the ignorant black people them in the crowd who is not educated enough and not not is not informed enough when them hear something up they so oh gosh man all you see them are going them know what they are doing you know. the politicians them know what they are doing divide and rule and that them are work with divide and rule and the whole of them, the whole of them, most of them, the credence to the white man religion, Christianity. White people bring that, come here, sir. Come show we. So there's a man named Jesus. We are going to help we. No care what. No care how much poor and suffering. Ah, uh, hey. May I tell you? Advertisement? No, all right. You know, say. I have a little joke. It's not even a joke, it's a serious thing, you know, but you know, say I should have called her, I should have called her, you know. But yeah, the Ganja Festival that I did, and a little old lady come to me. So she said, she's a 70 year old. Really, that tail on the place, I couldn't get to go down there to talk to her. So I sit down up there and I wait. When I go down there, I see this little old lady sit down with a whole heap of bag. So she come to talk to me. So she said to me, you know, say, I think I come to talk to you because I think you can help me. So I said, what? Well, she said she used to sell ganja. 
Long time she used to smoke a ganja from Westmoreland, go to Kingston, go sell ganja at Kingston. I say, she say, yeah, man, she and her son used to plant ganja. But them science are son. So I say, what do you mean science are son? This is your son. She said, well, a doctor Montego beer. Them kill her son. So I say, what do you mean the doctor Montego beer kill your son? She said, well, what happened is that them diagnose the son with cancer. Somebody said them diagnose the son with cancer. Why you feel say a science kill him? She said, look your man. Look your man. Me did have one ganja book. And the ganja book, a man come at the yard, come take it away. And that ganja book could have made me make some money. Because it have some things in there where we could have it really rent the book. And she got along to her book. But you know, she said to her, the doctor now, she said, I said, so when the doctor do down at the thing, she said, our, our relative who is a nurse come from foreign and go down at the hospital and the doctor take some scissors and cut some wrong tripe in her son and kill her son. I said, so what did so so, so that have to do with the book? She said, yeah, a man named John come take away the book. And she now come to me now because them call the doctor name on the radio. And she think the doctor is done that me now would have it hear the doctor and talk to the doctor down at the place. So I said, I said, ma'am, you know, say, I never listen to the radio when I'm calling the doctor the name on the radio. She said, yes, yes, yes. You listen, I said, I don't listen to the radio all the while, you know, so I couldn't know. So I did they talk now. Me like an idiot now. Me, I, mean, I mean, like, I kid you not. You know, say, me know about two brethren in my life. Me know two brethren in my life with the name Jesus. I mean, seriously, name Jesus. One a Montego Bay and one a Kingston. Jesus, in time, used to live a Montego Bay. I want to yell up Jesus, you know, from Montego Bay. Everybody know Jesus and Montego Bay. All right. In the course of reason, the do man, do man say, well, you know, say, me must get back my book, you know. Me must get back my book. Because Jesus there in the yard and him take care of me. He, Jesus always take care of me. He hear me like a big idiot. He hear me like a big idiot to do my dog. So why not make Jesus talk to John and bring back the book and go find out the doctor who you say kill your son? The woman stopped him out. <laughs> the woman stopped him out a minute and I look at my face, you know. That means I when I said to her, though, she said, she said, Muta. You go on, man. You see, Jesus, Jesus live with me and him take care of me every day. He me still like a big idiot now. Because me, I think, say, somebody I yard named Jesus. Like oh, me, no man who named Jesus. Me say, me say, Mama, let me tell you something now. It don't make sense to come to me now. I better you ask Jesus to find the brother who take away the book. And then go down a man to go be make Jesus go down a man. You do man no no. Mota, you can't go and run joke. But you see my Lord and Savior. You see when you say my Lord and Savior, the people laugh at me the fact that you know, Mr. Baba, I better the God truth. You know. Me never mean for ridicule. Not the way I say you no, know, but me never know say I say Jesus there. She said Jesus there are yard and Jesus take care of her. Me really think so was a man there are yard named Jesus. Anyway, the reason why I say that, you know, is to say this. That you have people like that little lady, you know, which is 70 a day old, where you used to run her ganja thing, ganja thing. She can't do it anymore. Because she get old now, she can't plant the ganja and them kill her son. You have people in a Jamaica, 70 a day old, 80 a day old, who sit down. And even though things are bad with them, like how she feels to them kill her son, because even though she didn't talk about Jesus, you know, she still tell me about science kill her son, you know. If that is all, that's the confusion when a black people mind about this thing, you know. Because if you have people who talk about Jesus in nine times, something go wrong with them, they're not going to talk about Jesus again, they're going to Obia man. Bully for people in Jamaica have more faith in the Obia man than faith in Jesus when things go bad with them, you know. Because them, you take out Af them, take out them, you take them out of Africa, but you don't take Africa out of them, you know. So even though them get, it's like a Santa Rea. It's like Santa Rea hold them, you know, where 
the Santa Maria use European Christian images for mask upon them altar them have like the cross crucifix and all them thing there but and they know them have all the herbs and all them something there upon the altar and them thing there if you're going to eat you know you see the obia the, the voodoo upon the, upon, the, upon, the, upon the altar you see a cross you could all see a poor picture too that is how them run the thing but the 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 the, the, the thinking the thinking of black people about this King James philosophy where the devil you got hold the devil and put him in a place for one thousand years and bind him and then you gotta let him go and then now the judgment that gonna start upon the people them and all who I mean the, the the woman they know, the woman they have this thing in her so much, you know. It not help her, you know. It not helping her one thing. To tell me, you say, Jesus, they are yard and I'll take care, you know. It not helping her because she said it not help her. Because she still has say, them science are son. And them still have talk about say she can't find a doctor. And she come to me who no know Jesus. And me no know she and Jesus are doing her yard at night time. Yeah. She said she sleep with Jesus, you know. I said, Mama, you sleep with Jesus? She said, yes. I sleep with Jesus and him take care of me. I mean, I said, but how oh, am I take care of you? I have so much problem. Oh, you cannot sleep with a man where, I mean, me and I have some deep reason about Jesus. You know, and it's long after me, I got realized, say, a Jesus Christ she had about. I mean, I said, how can we, how can we in a this, this thinking for how much years now? In and out of the thinking, and with grandparents, them come and believe in it, and them just dead, poor. And we are things say, Well, you know, the riches of the world um, is nothing, we have to really prepare for the next life. Which next life will not talk about? Which next life? And then them see what I tell say the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. And them I tell you that, you know. Them I read King James Bible and I tell you these things, you know. And when you look on the, 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 the poverty stricken Jamaican black people and you're looking at the crowd. You know the crowd when, 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 when the politician them with them green cloth and the politician them with them orange cloth. Hold up them hand and I say, Poor what your PPNP. We're looking at the crowd of peer poor people. Peer people that have no house, them no own no business, them no own no house. Some of them can't even fix, I mean, them clothes look how weird, them not no teeth, and them mouth. I mean, like, I mean, it's some terrible looking people you are looking at, you know, black people. Who lamp on these people, and then you hear the prime minister come tell you, say, she, nah, she never tell you, say, she can't have election. Who tell you, say, we like, me tell you, me here on the TV. I did not tell anybody that I was calling. <laughs> what a terrible thing for them. To what you never hear, she said. Yeah. She said, I, I tell you, say, I call an election. Who no hear me utter in my mouth say me a call no election this year? And you know what? It's true she talk. Yeah. It's true she talking. She never tell nobody. So she a call no election this year. But guess what? Them prepare for call the election until something happen between them. Them have a drawback. But even though she never tell nobody, the signs and wonders was there. So, when them really tell you, you know, say, who's an idiot? Is a, is a, is a Damien Crawford effect. Yes. Catch your people, them. Yes. Is a Damien Crawford effect. PNP use for the people, them, when them talk about, I never call no election. I never told them to say I call election. But guess what? I'm going to be like me, I call election. I trick me, I trick the people, them. It's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Terrible thing. And now we see the people, they might kill one another. Kill one another. Again. How long? 
how long black people are going to sit down and make politicians and preachers have you know, this, this quagmire of nastiness, this quagmire of cruelty, and then turn around and talk about Satan and devil and devil and devil. No devil, no do nothing round here. And I got them one telling us that the people them have devil the people them. No devil not doing nothing round here. And the people them are turned against themselves because them get influenced by politician and preacher. The politician them right now, the preacher them on Sunday, devastate them thinking and them consciousness. May I tell you, man, it's evil, man, evil. And we see it spread now. We see it spread. Because them ISIL people there, in the name of freedom, God, and politics, I kill people, I behead people. And we see that happen years ago, 400 years ago, 500 years ago, in Europe. And we see them go to Africa, go kill Wally for Africa in the name of Jesus. And them bring away Anya in the name of Jesus. And we go to Ghana, and we see the two churches in front of the, the dungeon, and our ancestors, women, Naked in a dungeon with no window, and on top of that, the people that keep church service. Oh gosh, man, them stand up on a slave ship and on a need the ship in the boil of the ship. Them pack with ancestors like sardine, and on top of the ship, them have opened them Bible. And I thank God for the bounty that them get. Oh gosh, man. Dear to it. Them don't adhere to it. Them start war in the name of them things. Black people now left them country and go to them country to start no war. Every day, black people learn to kill black people. Other people kill everybody else, including black people. Black people kill black people. They have a place named Chicago, they call it now Chirac. A Chirac, they call it Chicago, you know. The way Chirac stay as one is that the amount of people where gun killing are going in Iraq, I mean, you know, Iraq, Chirac, a Chirac, Chicago. We are going now. And mostly black people are doing it. And then when you look at the police killing them in America, black people are get dead by white people are kill them. Most of the youth them are dead from police killing and white people kill them. Black people. And when you look at Jamaica, Jamaica is in the top five most murderous countries in the world. And who are killed black people and so no black people. Black people are killed black people. White people are killed black people. Arab are killed black people. Arab are killed white people. White people are killed Arab. And everybody are killed black people. <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> including black people. You cannot imagine that. White people are kill black people, Arab are kill black people. I mean, all Chinese are kill black people, but Chinese are kill black people in a more underground little way. You understand? But everybody are kill black people, even black people are kill black people. I mean, <laughs> but we don't kill nobody because we're religious. We're religious. We're very religious. You know what I'm I saw it's a terrible thing. Terrible, terrible thing. Tell your man, the youth has said the right thing. The still the youth has said the right thing. Believe you me. I and mean, we I say, I mean, how much more? How much more? I mean, we see the thing in front of we. And we see the thing now work. And we keep on doing the same thing the same way all the while and expect to get a different result. We need to do something different. Return to our ancestral legacy. Redefine yourself. Get out of them way of seeing the world. Not because them decide the logics. It means uh, it must be logical for you. Because we realize that uh, all of them thinking is to sustain them. So what am to we? How long African people are going to fight African people for where white people teach them? 
ou bien koko a evm vous go into evm meanwhile black people are waiting for go a evm they might inherit everything from the earth and a thief the land take away the land from where and I build up them this and I build up them that if the world is not going to end how come the man look forward for new things and new ideas to make life Man, I'm a plan for y'all go, go on Mars and all them way there. In case anything happens to the earth, them can't go back, them can't go on Mars because them said it look like life can't sustain for Mars and all. Meanwhile, we don't have so I wait for God even and I talk about the next. When we're dead, we're going to happen. How the hell we are talking about when we're dead? What happened to this life? It's a terrible thing, you know. It's a terrible thing. It's like a man I talk about two head better than one. And if two head better than one, let me say God don't know him to that though. To make man with one head. If you put two heads together, you're supposed to have a better result. We must think. Man, I talk about sunrise and sunset and the earth, the four corners of the earth. And them are, and them are imposed for them understanding pan we and we suppitine without even think. When them talk about four corners of the earth, how them get four corners? Because them think that the world is flat. We know that the world is flat. But we still maintain this talk. Just like how we say we are West Indian. As African people call, we say we say West Indian. But we're not saying nothing wrong. People tell us, say, boy, I'm out of what kind of thing that. They're not going make no difference to nothing. Add up the whole of them. One, one cocoa full up the basket. You know, the greatest part of our window is the holy night. The greatest part of the basket is the part where I have no, I have no weave. Because they saw everything I will go in now. The greatest part of the window is the space between the window. So when man I tell you, say, it not make a difference, you know, them little things, them little things, the little things, them, that make the big things happen and work. The little things make the big things happen and work. And if you go on, don't realize, say, the divinity of man must be exposed to his action and the goodliness that he perform to him fellow human being. That is the divinity where man should all look for and expose. You must expose the divinity in you. Because that is where you have. You have your brains. You have your brains. And you hear Tracy Chapman say, all that we have is our soul. I'm going to play a tune later. But I want to go forward with the Satan concept and the idea of the Satan. After we go round and go round, we're going to come right round to this, you know. So, I want you to take a listen to this documentary. Yeah. Because we're going to try to find a documentary in the little archives where we have for really coincide or put together with all the events where we say are take place around we you know with the ISIL thing, with the invasion of Iraq, with the guys then we just get the we, we, we shut up the place today. In a, that is a normal thing now in America. Common thing in America yeah, right now. The enemy within. The enemy within. When they thought that the enemy was outside, is the enemy within. Which part you think the divinity there is within you? Which part you think the badness there and the cruelty and the wickedness there are in you with there? Which part you think the love and the harmony and the peace where all of us are Which part you think it that in you? So just like how America look for enemies outside of them, when them look, them see it inside of them. So you have to confront the enemy within. You have to confront. You have to confront the devil within. There's no human devil. There's no human form. There is no human form. That is the devil. The only human that form in the devil is the mind of human beings constructing good and constructing bad in order to maintain whether good or bad in the environment that they live in. Our perception is defined by where we are from and where we are. 
and how we perceive and construct things in the environment. So we either draw from other people or we look into our minds and brains and evaluate for ourselves what is what and what is not without just sucking everything where people say to you or where people do what say to you. So when you hear about devil, you start to say a devil, everybody a devil and everybody has seen it and all the things and people who don't follow where you are say, you say them a pig and them a heathen, them a devil, them a this and all sort of thing. So, we don't try to find a documentary or we find a documentary. So, listen and listen well to the story that this documentary has to tell. Wait there. <laughs> okay? We are weird feet here. We are going here, so. All right. Lucifer, Beelzebub, the Beast, Satan. Hail Satan. When you say Satan to me, I think God. He has been called many names. He has taken many strange and different forms. The idea of God's evil enemy has been around for thousands of years. And it's still as powerful as ever. Evil is real. And it must be opposed. But where did Satan's story begin? Where did he come from? And how did he become the Prince of Darkness? More than 3,000 years ago, in the deserts and pasture lands of the Middle East, unknown hands wrote the earliest chapters of the Hebrew Bible. If the devil had a birthplace, surely it was here, somewhere in the book known to Christians as the Old Testament. In the oldest books of the Bible, a character called Satan does appear, but he's nothing like the Satan we imagine. When we read the Old Testament, we find that from time to time there is this strange dark figure who pops up called the Satan. And this, the word the Satan is actually a, a, a title. The word means the accuser. And to begin with, it seems that the Satan is one of the angels or attendants in the heavenly court, one of God's servants who, in a sense, um, had to do some of the dirty work. This Satan has no power of his own. He does only what God tells him. Nor is he a horrible creature with horns and a tail. There's no kind of prince of darkness, somebody who's standing opposite to God. Throughout most of the text, there's no concept at all of an evil force. One of Satan's earliest appearances is as an angel in the book of Job. In one of the best known stories in the Bible, Satan argues that Job, one of God's most loyal servants, is only pious because he has a good life. God agrees that Satan can test Job by inflicting on him all kinds of diseases and calamities. In the end, in spite of dreadful sufferings, Job continues to worship God, and Satan loses the argument. The Satan who makes Job's life a misery isn't a demon or even a bad angel. And he doesn't live in hell. There wasn't any kind of concept of a hell like we have, you know, it's a place of fiery torment and torture. In fact, to the ancient Israelites, what happened when you died was really very little. You went to a place called Sheol, and this was just a sort of dark, shadowy place, a sort of underworld, where everybody who died went, irrespective of whether you were good or bad. So where is the Satan we know? Where's the fiend who's eternally at war with the forces of good? 
the monster who rules over the flames of hell and punishes sinners? Where is the fallen angel with his legions of demon helpers tempting humans to do evil things so that he can win their souls? If the traditional devil doesn't come from the Jewish Old Testament, where does he come from? Since human history began, people all over the world have believed in demons and evil spirits. A few share some traits with our devil, like horns or a beard, but none are as powerful as Satan. So where did people first get the idea of an ultimate evil being? Three and a half thousand years ago, in ancient Persia, where Syria, Iraq and Iran are now, there were many gods, good and evil, until one man, a religious teacher called Zoroaster, reduced the whole complicated cast of characters to two. Zoroaster is a revolutionary, primarily because he, in one sense, personifies these ethical categories into a good god, Ahura Mazda, and a bad god, Ahriman. And this is an extremely potent idea and one which forms the basis for later conceptions of dualistic thought. In other words, the separation between good and evil. The good god is the all-knowing Ahura Mazda, the god of light and order. The evil god is Ahriman, god of chaos, darkness and lies. In Zoroaster's teachings, the universe is a battlefield between the gods of good and evil, and every person on earth must take sides. After death, good people are rewarded in heaven, while sinners are punished in a dark and gloomy hell. It is one of those ultimate, rather attractive kinds of dualism, uh, that this life is a struggle between good and evil, therefore choose good, between light and darkness, therefore choose light. Under the powerful Persian emperor Darius the Great, the teachings of Zoroaster become the official religion of the Persian Empire, an empire which includes the lands of Israel. The new Persian ideas about good and evil soon find their way into the Jewish scriptures. So we get a clear demarcation of what we would call Jewish ideas, okay, and we can spot the Zoroastrian ideas in the Old Testament. They are there. Notions of heaven and hell, okay? The beginning of actually seeing the devil personified as the fierce opponent of God. As the Persian Empire in turn is defeated by Alexander the Great, Greek culture comes to ancient Israel. The Greeks introduce a huge cast of gods and goddesses, including one who will shape our image of Satan for centuries. Hades has a black face or black beard. He sits on a throne, often made of ebony, and he wields a two-pronged fork, not for prodding sinners, but for blasting things to bits. To the classical Greeks, the underworld was ruled by Hades, who was the god of the dead. He was one of the Olympian gods, but he seems to have spent most of his time in this dark, shadowy underworld, which is also called Hades. Now, he wasn't a very nice character. He seems to have been very morbid and morose, and nobody really liked him. None of the gods liked him, and certainly no humans liked him. Hades wasn't very likable, but he wasn't evil either. In fact, the ancient Greeks see Hades as a god of justice. They believe that when people die, they go to Hades, and he decides whether they go to a place of happiness or a place of misery. As ruler of the world underground, Hades is also the god of wealth and abundance. In a dim memory of Hades, people have believed for centuries that the devil can make you rich. As well as the brooding character of Hades, the Greeks give the world another familiar ingredient of the devil's story. In a famous myth, 
Zeus, the greatest of the gods, defeats the winged serpent Typhon and throws him down to Tartarus, the lowest region of the underworld. Over the following centuries, the myth grows into the story of how the angel Satan rebels against God and is thrown out of heaven with all his followers. Satan's allies, the fallen angels, become his legion of demons. When we think of hell, we think of fire, lava, and sinners being horribly tortured. But where did this picture come from? The underworld of Hades doesn't have fire, but ancient Jerusalem does. When we read the Gospels, we come upon Jesus uh, warning people that there is this dangerous fate that might await them, and it's called Gehenna, which was the old smoldering rubbish heap in ancient Jerusalem. And because of the stink of the place, and because there was so much in the way of rubbish, periodically it would set fire to, and the fires there would burn for several days, if not weeks. Gehenna was the place where the Jerusalem authorities burned the bodies of executed criminals. Over time, the place came to stand for something supernatural. A spiritual fate that would await the wicked at the end of time. Gehenna was the inspiration for the terrors of hell. By the time the Christian Gospels are written, towards the end of the first century AD, Satan has grown into a powerful figure. By now, Jewish lands are ruled by the mighty Roman Empire. It was a time when the Romans were hated bitterly. To many Jews and Christians persecuted by Rome, Satan is the evil force behind Caesar's throne. In the New Testament book of Revelation, the writer gives Satan one of his most mysterious names. The Beast, 666. The Beast could refer to the Roman Emperor himself. The author of Revelation says that the Beast has a human number and it's 666. Now this has traditionally been seen as um, a reference to the Emperor Nero. And that's because if you take Nero Caesar in Aramaic and count up the numerical values of um, those letters, it comes to 666. The book of Revelation says that the devil was sent down by God into the abyss where he will be locked up for a thousand years. When he gets out, the end of the world will come. An apocalyptic battle will take place as good and evil fight it out to the end. Satan will be let loose and will put up a final attempt to, um, to rule the world. This is kind of the, the dragon of chaos back again. This is evil opposed to God. So it's drawing on very, very ancient cosmological speculation, not so much from Judaism itself, but from the surrounding um, areas, particularly the Persians. So what does the devil look like at the dawn of the Christian era? Often he's got black skin and hair, like Hades, ruler of the underworld. His wings echo the story that he was once an angel, although they look more like the wings of a dragon. For thousands of years, the dragon was the symbol of an evil force. And it's from the dragon that Satan inherits his taloned feet. When Satan isn't being a dragon, he's a snake. The serpent, said to have tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, has long been believed to represent the devil, although the scriptures don't actually say so. In fact, Christian leaders disagree, sometimes violently, about what the devil is like. But one thing they do agree on, he is busy working with and through their enemies. Four centuries after Christ, a Roman emperor, Constantine the Great, converts to Christianity. Within a generation, the once persecuted religion is the official creed of the mightiest empire on earth. 
Christian bishops now have real power, backed up by the state, and they use Satan to help them keep it. Again and again, church leaders claim that those who disagree with them, especially other Christian groups, are working for the devil. As Constantine made it the state religion and the state church and an established religion, what Constantine and his immediate successors found hardest to um, put up with was heresy. Catholic theologians would have said that because heretics didn't believe the correct Catholic faith, they must be worshipping the evil one instead, God's enemy. The logic is relentless. It's us and them. If you're not with the church and the empire, you're with Satan. It's a short step for the church to demand that heretics be put to death. The first executions come 450 years after Christ. Over the following centuries, the numbers of people killed for supposedly working for Satan grows to many tens, possibly hundreds of thousands. Under the protection of the Roman Empire, the Christian religion grows quickly. But the bishops worry that the pagan gods are far too popular. Thousands of Romans still pray to the winged goddess Fortuna, the bringer of luck. But the most popular pagan god of all is Pan. Christian leaders see him as a serious threat who must be discredited. Let's think of the case of Pan and uh, in Arcadia, and he becomes um, a, a sort of demon, whereas he's actually a very benign god of music and happiness uh, in Arcadia, and he becomes um, a, a sort of demon, whereas he's actually a very benign god of music and happiness and lovemaking and altogether to be admired, but becomes a, a goat-legged demon satire in the, uh, the later Christianized version of it. Satan now adopts Pan's best-known features. He becomes an ugly, leering beast with horns on his head. His body is hairy, and he has Pan's cloven hooves, although sometimes he keeps the taloned feet of the ancient dragon. So outlandish has he become that he often has a second face on his belly. One of the greatest thinkers of the early Christian church is St. Augustine. Augustine is keen to show that the old nature gods are dangerous demons. According to Augustine, male demons called incubi appear to women at night and seduce them. Even more disturbing for Augustine, saintly men could be visited in their beds by female demons called succubi and forced to do sinful things against their will. When during the long dark hours their frustrated minds produced all sorts of sexual visions and erotic pictures, and, uh, they had to expel these from their minds. And, well, how on earth could this have come into my, my pious celibate mind? It isn't me. This is an entity. This is something downright evil. By the Middle Ages, after a thousand years of Christian... Okay, we're going to continue um, this... Middle Ages, after a thousand years of Christian teaching, the church has persuaded its followers that the devil and his demons are real and that Satan is a powerful enemy. The problem is that some Christians take the idea a lot further than the bishops want. Some branches of Christianity did see the world itself as created, not so much by Satan, but by a, a lesser evil God. And so for them, of course, everything to do with, with the world, with matter, with human flesh, was seen in, in negative terms. We do find the emergence of something called Gnosticism. Gnostic Christians carried with them this very clear notion of a good God and a bad God. There's the good God who created everything spiritual 
and there's the evil god who created everything physical which means that everything that you can see or touch or sense with any of the five senses is actually coming from the evil god one group which is taking enthusiastically to the gnostic idea of good and evil is the cathars of southern france to the cathars all material possessions are evil and belong to the devil. For a church now wealthy and powerful, this is an uncomfortable, even dangerous teaching. The common people loved and admired them, called them les bonhommes, because they were healers. When the Cathars went around doing Catharist, then you were actually in league with Satan. Brothers and sisters, this is Janice. To the church was to question God. Pope Innocent III announced a crusade against the Cathars. He tried to convert them back to Catholicism. That hadn't worked. The only thing he could do now was kill them. The crusade against the Cathars, launched in 1209, turns into a brutal 45-year war. At least 100,000 people die. Partly for saying that Satan is even more powerful than the church says he is. The crusade against the Cathars is against fellow Christians. But for almost two centuries, the crusades are mostly about fighting Islam for control of the Middle East. In medieval Europe, Islam is until found innocent and can be held for as long as the authorities want. Anyone who questions the Inquisition is immediately suspected of being in league with the devil. In the fight against Satan and the powers of evil, medieval rulers believe that, as in any war, information is vital. Up till now, the church has not officially allowed Christians to be tortured, although torturing Jews and Muslims is acceptable. But in May 1252, Pope Innocent IV rules that Christians suspected of heresy can be tortured until they confess they are working for the devil and inform on co-conspirators. Once you've set up a debate that defines somebody as a servant of Satan, then you have put them in a position where you can do what you want to them because you are justified by working for the forces of good. Generally, once somebody had been accused of heresy, there was no way they could clear themselves. No matter what they said, because they were a heretic, therefore in league with the devil, therefore anything they said was like to be a lie. But the torturers can't do whatever they please. They are supposed to follow strict guidelines. In theory, and according to Pope Innocent IV in the middle of the 13th century, torture should be limited, it should not draw blood, it should not lead to serious permanent damage to the person who's being tortured. In practice, these regulations are not always followed. But there's also something which the psychologists would refer to as a rationalization process, that it could all be very well Oh yes, we are trying to save your immortal soul. We're trying to keep you out of hell. We're trying to prevent the devil from getting you. And what they really mean is we'd rather fancy your farm. All over Europe, the new powers, supposed to be used against Satan, are used by the unscrupulous to seize wealth or to do down their enemies. In 1307, King Philip the Fair of France brings witchcraft charges against the leaders of the Knights Templar, the fabulously wealthy order of crusaders. Philip accuses the Templars of worshipping a pagan idol called Baphomet, a supposedly satanic figure. The Templars have been involved in the Middle East in negotiations with Muslims. And some people in Western Europe thought they had been in league with the Muslims. And because the Muslims, everybody knew, in inverted commas, were involved in magic, there is their Templars were involved in magic too. They were attacked and largely destroyed on Friday the 13th of October in 1307. Sealed orders given by Philip Le Bel to his seneschals to attack every Templar stronghold 
simultaneously. Ever since the purge of the Templars, Friday the 13th has been seen as an unlucky day, somehow connected with satanic forces. In 1320, the war against Satan has wound up another notch. Pope John XXII orders the Inquisition to target any kind of witchcraft, sorcery, or necromancy. A big worry is that unscrupulous priests who know how to drive out devils with the rites of exorcism might insist them to invite the devil in. Formulas, Latin formulas and rituals which can be used to command the demon. Now, once you've got a Latin formula that has power to command a demon, I could use that to command a demon to do my washing up, you know? I could use that power to command a demon to get this woman I fancy into bed. The necromancers are interested in using the formulae of exorcism to command demons to do other things that they are interested in. You know, a demon could make me rich. A demon could find some hidden treasure for me. Fear that necromancers and witches are all around, conjuring up demons and making pacts with the devil, sweeps across Europe. One of the first cases investigated by the Inquisition is in the Irish city of Kilkenny. In 1324, in a dispute of one of the richest women in the town, Dame Alice Cataila, is accused of witchcraft, heresy, and of having a demon lover called Robin. Alice Cataila, a landowner in Kilkenny, who had several husbands, so had stepchildren brought a charge against her that she'd poisoned her previous husbands in order to obtain the land. And she'd poisoned or killed them otherwise through witchcraft. Alice manages to escape to England. Her unfortunate servant, Petronella, is tortured and burned at the stake. The campaign against necromancers, sorcerers and witches lasts 300 years and kills between 60,000 and 300,000 people. The vast majority of the victims are women. prone to the devil, more likely to sin, more likely to be led astray. They were also thought to be less intellectual than men. Women were seen as closer to animals and part of this was that they were more susceptible to temptation, that they were more easily seduced by material gratification. As the Inquisition goes about its grisly business, rounding up suspects and interrogating them, Many clerics and lay people worry that it's all guesswork. Perhaps they're missing even more witches than they're finding. But how can you tell who is one of Satan's helpers? What you need is a standard test. In 1486, two German Dominican monks publish a textbook for inquisitors called Maleus Maleficarum, the hammer of witches. The book can catch 22. Not only is witchcraft heresy, not believing in witches is heresy as well. The Malleus Maleficarum was the manual to how to get rid of all these demonic fleas that had infested a human being. It was a book of what witches were, what witches did. Malleus Maleficarum tells the Inquisitor everything he needs to know. Witches have the mark of Satan on their bodies, a birthmark or a wart. They can fly by rubbing magical herbs on their skin. And they gather at Satan-worshipping ceremonies called Sabbaths. At these, they celebrate a twisted version of the Christian Mass, kissing the devil's rear end in a blasphemous act of homage. Certainly there was a fear at that time, which was why Malleus Maleficarum sold so many through so many editions and is still in print. Thirty years after Malleus Maleficarum was written, 
Martin Luther leads the Protestant Reformation, splitting the Christian Church in two. Each faction, Protestant and Catholic, claims the other is in league with the evil one. Both sides use Malaeus Maleficarum to find Satanists, and not just in order to destroy them. Witch hunting is a kind of scientific quest. The idea is, if you can understand witches and the devil, you can fight them. The whole business of witch hunting is, is, is almost a sort of intellectual research project. I need to gather a bit more data about, uh, you know, what, what demons do. So I'm going to interrogate a few more witches to get a bit more data, and then I'm going to write it up in my book. The cutting edge of scientific inquiry. Right across Europe, hysteria about Satan sweeps Protestant and Catholic countries alike. In Scotland, James VI, one of the best educated kings in Europe, is so caught up in the craze, he writes a book about the devil and witchcraft. Called Demonology, James' book sets out to prove that Satan-worshipping witches are everywhere and that they are the gravest threat to the security of the state. He surrounded himself uh, with advisors, and mainly religious advisors, who would protect him from the demons that he feared so much. He saw it everywhere. Well, James was certainly um, quite militant about this. He thought he was fighting a war. Even as James leads the fight against the devil and the forces of evil, is helping James to keep his crown. James can always point to the figure of Satan and say, if it weren't for me, look who would be ruling in my place. Although this is quite frightening, uh, it's also in a way quite gratifying for James. One of the witches who was interrogated um, was asked, why is the devil attacking our king? And the witch who was confessing allegedly answered, this is, this is what was recorded anyway in her, her confession, um, you know, the devil is doing this because King James is the greatest enemy that the devil has in the world. When the New World of the Americas is colonized by Europeans, the devil travels with them. The Puritan colonists who arrive from England in the late 1600s are strong believers in the power of Satan. They're convinced that everyone who isn't a Puritan is controlled by the devil, and that women are especially susceptible to Satan's powers. They had established what might be called Puritan communities and were looking to build a great example for the rest of Christendom. If you were enjoying yourself, or if a group of you were singing or dancing or having a drink, then those who were opposed to that kind of fun were quite certain that Satan was filling the glasses for you. In 1688 in Boston, an Irish laundry woman called Mary Glover is accused of bewitching the children of one of her customers. Proof of her pact with the devil includes several rag dolls found in her house. Mary Glover was Irish and a the first language was Gaelic, and one of the tests to prove that you weren't a witch was to speak the Lord's Prayer. The linguistic difficulties meant that she couldn't speak the Lord's Prayer without, as they saw it, blasphemy. She was hanged as a witch in 1688. Three years after Mary Glover is hanged, less than 20 miles away at Salem, Massachusetts, the testimony of three young girls leads to a mass execution. Some of the children were said to be possessed by spirits sent from the witches. And so when they were standing witness, they were effectively, they were performing being possessed. In the Salem witch hunt, 150 people are arrested. 19 men and women are hung or cr 17 others die in prison. 
In an ironic twist of the story, the Salem jury later apologized, blaming the devil for their mistake. Tell you, say, this thing is very interesting, very interesting, you know, say, me damn me yard, I listen to it quite a few times, and me I say, and me I tell you, say, oh, well, I really want to find a documentary in the night, you have to, for just match to where I go on with the different religion, them, and this and that, and this is the perfect one, the history of Satan, the devil, that is what it named, the history of Satan, the devil. Very, very, as it connect to now, as it connect to now, it's a very interesting thing. Apologize, blaming the devil for their mistake. By the 1700s, the witch craze in America and Europe is almost over. A new, more scientific view of the world is gaining ground. Modernism, as the project that we get from the 18th century Enlightenment, actually banished religion, superstition, and all of that, and just said that that belongs to the Dark Ages. We are now in the modern world. We believe in facts. We believe in... If you want to be religious, that's a, a private option, which you can go and practice somewhere else. Although the witch hunts have ended, and the educated classes of Europe and America even start to question whether the devil exists... In the folk tales of ordinary people, Satan lives on. But he's very different from the formidable and terrifying devil of the witch finders. One of my own favorites is that of Dunstan, who was a very powerful blacksmith. The devil arrives and asks to have his shoes replaced. And he simply gets hold of his nose with two red hot tongs and throws him out. And that is a very, very different devil. That's a devil that, that you can put in his place. By now, the devil has shared some of his ugliness and crude habits. In fact, he's often a member of the decadent aristocracy. Dressed in fine clothes and mixing in fashionable company. Like Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, and the Satan of the ancient Gnostic heresies, this Satan controls the material world of wealth, power, and sex. He can give all these things to you if you promise him your soul. The most famous of all devil folk tales is the story of Faust. The devil, in the form of the clever and devious Mephistopheles, offers to grant Faust all his wishes. But there's a price. One of the things that many necromancers or people using necromantic spells are interested in is how to get women into bed. Faust is very interested in that, and he gets all kinds of women, including Helen of Troy. Faust's bargain with the devil ends in disaster for Faust. Mephistopheles calls in his debt, and Faust dies horribly. The devil takes him away to spend eternity in hell. As the power of religion fades, and the age of popes and kings gives way to the age of revolution and democracy, a new devil arrives on the scene. This devil is utterly different from the treacherous fiend of Christian tradition. He is a tragic and lonely figure, a hero battling against tyrannical authority in the shape of a cruel and overbearing god. Satan is now a brave and handsome rebel. And so you get the kind of romantic view of Satan as not really a villain but the opposite of that, Satan is a good guy who's challenging the boss. In the age of Romanticism, we find the, the poets, particularly like Byron, creating a Byronic hero who is somehow dark and sinister and has a past. And so, far from being something to shun and something to fear, the devil is admired.
With the 20th century, the devil's fortunes take a turn for the worse. No longer feared or admired, he becomes a figure of fun. He even joins the world of commerce, helping to sell products from wine to chocolates and beer. In the age of marketing and the consumer society, bring lure of the forbidden to a tired brand. It's a long way from an apocalyptic war between good and evil. It has been a hallmark of the 20th century for the devil to be treated as a figure of fun. We find the devil is neither better nor worse than the people he's dealing with. and He's just a, a man among men. Satan seems to have been cut down to size. The Prince of Darkness has become a mischievous imp. But in a surprising twist, a different Satan, the glamorous rebel so admired by the revolutionaries of the 19th century, makes a startling comeback in the 1960s. There was a strong sense of rebellion against everything that anointed the Western political power structure. And it was Christian, capitalist, it was um, warmongering. And so the counterculture started exploring anything that was counter to that. In 1966, occult showman Anton LaVey found the Church of Satan in San Francisco. Part religion, part money-making racket, the Church of Satan attracts lurid headlines, mostly encouraged by the publicity-seeking LaVey himself. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. He called himself Anton Sander LeVay of Romanian descent, but the truth of the matter is he was Howard Stanton Levy, who was born in Cook County, Illinois in 1930. He held these weekend lectures and witch circles in his and people would come in and pay their two dollars a head. Well, finally, he had this friend that was a publicist who said, you know, I have an idea. Why don't you turn this thing into a church? You could make a bundle of money. And, of course, that's what he did. He has been called everything from a carny to a manipulator to a brilliant philosopher. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. There were doctors, lawyers, college students, factory workers, farmers, you name it. They came from all levels of society. In spite of the invented rituals, mostly staged for the cameras, neither LaVey nor his followers believe in a real devil. What LaVey admires is Satan the rebel the non-conformist, provoking the establishment. Predictably, America is fascinated. In 1967, the 60s fascination with the occult, spearheaded by LaVey's Church of Satan, gets a powerful boost from Hollywood. The film, Rosemary's Baby, a dark tale of devil worshippers in Manhattan, is a massive and unexpected hit. In Roman Polanski's masterpiece, the heroine's innocuous neighbors are part of a satanic conspiracy to help the Prince of Darkness father a child who will rule the world. In Rosemary's Baby, Satan triumphs in the end. But the Christian, the Christian backlash to the story comes in the 1973 blockbuster, The Exorcist. This time, the devil, who has possessed a young girl, is defeated by the forces of good in the shape of two priests. The old belief that women are especially susceptible to satanic influence is revived two centuries after the Salem witch trials. We would be seriously in error if we were to underestimate the power of Hollywood. I think the biggest impact was probably around the, um, the time of the, the Exorcist. I know many people I've talked to about the movie, especially those raised in a Christian household, who are very frightened by it, very upset. It's the war between good and evil, but 
evil is in a whole new dimension and it's very personal. It, it made being possessed almost fashionable. That the, the, the numbers of people who were seen to be possessed just took off. I've been invited to exorcise uh, people who were convinced they had a demon. Uh, and you will, you will get people who put them through it. Um, and it can be very violent and very dramatic and, and very expressive. But it can really flip someone into serious, serious. Hollywood's discovery that fortunes can be made with stories of possession and devil worship stokes the fires of a paranoia that has lain dormant since the days of the witch trials. In the 1980s, stories about a vast conspiracy of organized Satanists sweep the media. Known as the Satanic Panic, Christian groups allege mass satanic abuse of children and tens of thousands of kidnappings. Part of the satanic panic started with accusations of satanic ritual abuse. Groups of people who declared themselves as Satanists were believed to be taking people and children and damaging them. There were all kinds of dark suggestions about children disappearing and about child sacrifice and ritual murder. Although hundreds of people are arrested and imprisoned, when the launches a full-scale investigation in the United States, it concludes that the satanic abuse allegations are all groundless. One of the horrifying things about human nature is that it lends itself to hysteria. Uh, you, you get it in all periods of history. I think you get it much more virulently nowadays because uh, one of the most potent instruments for spreading hysteria is the modern telecommunications industry. If members of satanic religions mostly don't believe in a supernatural devil and don't pray to Satan, what does the devil represent? Some satanists claim the devil stands for a spirit of change. A lot of people are frightened by the term Satanism. A lot of people automatically think that Satanists are bad people. They should be no more than anyone else they meet. You know, what Satanism means to me is opposition and balance. Alternative thought, playing the devil's advocate. There is no good and evil. I mean, to a mouse, a cat is as horrible evil thing with fangs but to the pet owner the cat is heavenly we create our own reality that's the whole idea behind satanism in the united states surveys show that almost half of americans believe the devil is real even non-religious people instinctively divide the world into good and evil the opposing principles taught by Zoroaster to the ancient Persians. If anything, recent events have made that belief even stronger. In September 2001, the massive terrorist attacks which destroyed the World Trade Center shocked America to its core. To many, it seemed as if sinister forces had gone on the offensive. It was easy to believe that this was a showdown between the forces of good and evil. To the U.S. government and a large section of American opinion, the attacks were about much more than politics. We've come to know truths that we will never question. Evil is real, and it must be opposed. You're either with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, by and large, you're going to be working hand in hand with Satan. It was Reagan that talked about the evil empire. Bush talks about the axis of evil. It's classic, ancient, dualistic thinking. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the job of catching Osama bin Laden, the man responsible for the atrocity, to Lieutenant General William G. Boykin. But according to Boykin, America's real foe isn't bin Laden. In the general's words, the enemy of the U.S. is a guy called Satan. Since 2001, 
The draconian measures taken by the U.S. and other governments in the war on terror are uncannily like those of the war on Satan of 400 years ago. Imprisonment without trial, secret hearings, anonymous tip-offs, and torture. We are seeing a similar willingness to, to justify mistreatment, to justify the, um, the removal of rights, the justifiable use of torture against the perceived enemy in the war against terrorism. If you're fighting a war against evil, what begins to happen, I think, is that you end up by turning into the evil that you're fighting. Controversially, President Bush called the invasion of Iraq a crusade. The similarities with the historic crusades against heretics are striking. They include a belief on the battlefield that the enemy are not just military opponents, but agents of pure evil. In November 2004, as U.S. forces launch a massive attack on the Iraqi city of Fallujah, a senior Marine officer, Lieutenant Colonel Gareth Brandl, makes clear who he thinks the enemy is. The enemy has got a face. He's called Satan. He's in Fallujah. We're going to destroy it. It's embroidery, it's myth-making, it's poetry. It can be good fun, except that it evils, a human invention, but one that's rebounded on us because it's given us permission uh, to do terrible things to each other, which is why I think that we should close hell down and finally banish the devil and get rid of him. Hi, FM, thought-provoking, always smoking. Lyrics like a bazooka. You are listening to Muta Baruka. Yes, that was a documentary tying in all the things them that we was talking about, and even the events of today, linking all the religious belief, people fighting evil sometimes become evil themselves and we can see that we can see that in a day the bombing of innocent people families and children where america obama sent drone over yemen and over afghanistan and pakistan and kill women and children as collateral damage we can see I still blowing up marketplaces with suicide bombers, beheadings, drownings, see them fighting evil. All of them, all of them. The drone strike them in Afghanistan is fighting evil. The beheadings in Assyria is fighting evil. The attack on Iraq. As he heard the man say a while ago, it's fighting evil. All of them fighting evil. Evil. They themselves become evil. A weird thing. Very, very weird. Yeah, see, the thing with it is that all the people afraid for doubt, you know. When them find themselves in a doubt situation, them get confused and perplexed. Well, you know, sometimes when you doubt, is that time you search for understanding and knowledge tripping because through the doubtfulness why you're going to really examine in this western world yeah, them put a thing by we name fear the fear factor is where grab way the fear factor is where make we don't use your brains and the whole of our brains, but our brains become docile when it comes on to religion and morality extends politics. Our brains get numbed. I think. Because somebody they don't think for we and put it in our thinking already. And we don't want to go against the grain. 
Because if we go against the green, something going to be named fear. Fear. It's a big, big problem, especially amongst black people. Fear. We fear so much that we hide from ourselves many, 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 many times.